Hello, everyone. Good evening, everyone. This is Monday, November 14th here at the Ottawa Rebel News headquarters. Where we're having some fun prior to starting. I am joined to my right here by Celine Gallas, a fellow Rebel News colleague. That's her when meets co host a live stream. Celine, how are you doing? I'm doing very good. Today was very exciting. We're, mm -hmm. uh, we're very happy to break this down for you. Yeah, definitely. lots of breaking ground stuff today. Yeah, definitely an exciting day. It was so, so great to follow. We heard from the LL, LRB, the CSIS, LRB, which is Liberal Research Bureau. Anyways, such a great day. Definitely stay tuned for that to see everything that went on today. And I am here to my left with Tom Morato. Tom, um, emergency, no, not emergency, like Freedom Convoy intern. <laughs> Slash key, <laughs> key figure. Tom, how are you doing? You forgot off grid. I live off grid. That's right. Off grid. Yes. How are you doing, Tom? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. So, just for people that haven't followed us in the past few weeks, if you haven't, make sure to go back and check all of our episodes. Tom, who are you? Oh, boy. I, you know what? I'm not going to answer that question because I've done about 50 or 60 interviews in the last few months. And I think I answer that. I don't know how many times. And I guess at the end of the day, if your viewers don't know who I am by now, I probably shouldn't be on your show because <laughs> you've, you've been my opening act for like three weeks now. This That's is true. Right. Well, this is true. Let's try to do our best presentation of Tom Morazzo. So that I have to present the people that come on the live stream. So yeah. Tom Morazzo, <laughs> if you go on LinkedIn, it's written that he's an intern with Freedom Convoy 2022. Yeah. Uh, he was one of the spokesperson of Freedom Convoy. He had some talks with the auto police, with uh, some people, some officials in the police. He was there basically with Tamara Leach, Chris Barber, Danny Bilford, and other key figures of the Freedom Convoy uh, throughout his duration when he was here in Ottawa. Is this accurate? That's perfect. Perfect. All right. Perfect. And also, so as you can see, Tom is dressed pretty well. I'm also dressed well. So if you want to comment down below in the chat, who is dressed better between me and Tom Morato? That's the reason why we're both wearing a, a full suit and a tie. <laughs> so if you want to make this, you know, if you, want, if you want to let us know who is dressed better between me and Tom Morato, you can always put it down in the chat down below. All right. Before we get to what went on today, um, a couple of announcements. If you want to help us fund our work here in Ottawa, if you find value um, in our content, you can go ahead and visit Trucker Commission dot com and there you can donate as much as you can five dollars ten dollars as much as you're as you're able to second thing rebel news live you've heard me talk about it a lot in the past few weeks it is happening this saturday in toronto and on the 25th well right when the commission and no no not on 25th on the 26th so a day after the commission ends in calgary is that right uh, I believe it's on the 25th, but it is in Calgary. And you can still go get a ticket to listen to some of uh, your favorite speakers. We're going to have Tamara Leach. We're mm -hmm. going to have um, Derek Fildebrandt, Andrew Lawton. We have huge people from Rebel like Ezra Levant, Sheila Gunry. Yeah. So you can come meet us, mingle with us. Go get a ticket at rebellive.com. Exactly. So yeah, either 25th or 26th, you can see it at Rebel, Rebel, rebelnewslive.com, as uh -huh. we just mentioned, rebelnewslive.com. Dot com if you want to meet all these great people. All right, let's get back to today. So today, who did we see at the commission? So we had two testimonies. Um, it was kind of like a panel. They were both giving their testimonies at the same time. So we had Rob Stewart, um, appointed deputy minister for uh, public safety in Canada. And then we also have Dominic Rashan. I, I'm saying this incorrectly. Anyways, he is the senior assistant uh, deputy minister for the National Cybersecurity Branch of the Public Safety for Public Safety in Canada. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So their testimonies were very, very interesting. Um, again, just like to point out right off the bat, they did all, both of them agreed that the Emergencies Act um, was helpful in some ways, but not necessary as we've heard. So now that that's out of the way, what we can, yeah, here we go. We can throw it to this clip right away then. Yeah, let's take a look at some of what they had to say. Yeah. Okay, well, we can, we can actually take a look. Well, just to begin the live stream, take a look at clip number one, mm -hmm. where an official from Public Safety Canada testified to the commission that uh, the intel that he had led him to believe that the Freedom Convoy would be a peaceful protest straight from the get-go. So uh, let's take a look at that. Uh, the expectation that I had was that the convoy would uh, park and stay for the weekend and leave on the Sunday. Okay. Mr. Roshan is... Is that your expectation? As far as the Ottawa situation was, yes. And we were also watching to see whether other protests that were bubbling across uh, the country would also, but the expectation was they would all be peaceful and they would last for that weekend. You know, uh, transport obviously had um, um, some concerns with regard to various protests uh, happening and how it might affect the flow of traffic, how it might affect uh, supply chain issues. 
from a transport perspective. Uh, Canada Border Services Agency, I think, started to uh, ask questions about uh, or particular port, ports of entry. And um, so from a critical infrastructure perspective, and this is really why GOC was, was involved, is to make sure that we were mindful that there could be impacts to critical infrastructure. And as a result, we were being uh, watchful. Hmm. You know, we heard a lot from these two people throughout the day. I think, you know, as much as we get credit to the testimony, I think we should give as much credit to Brendan Miller and Rob Kitteridge, <laughs> Brendan Miller from Foster LLP, who's representing Freedom Corp, and Rob Kitteridge, K Kitteridge, I don't Kitteridge, know how to pronounce yeah. Kitteridge, Rob Kitteridge yeah. from uh, the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedom for their excellent cross examination. Oh, yeah. So, what was your main takeaway from those two testimony? Like in the clip that we just saw? Well, the clip or just overall, yeah. Um, it was great. I mean, it, it confirms what we already knew, but now 100% since this week has started and, you know, we've had so many testimonies that we've seen over the course of, it's been like, what, about three weeks that this has been, been going weeks. on? Yeah. There you go. Four weeks. Like, that's a lot of people that have testified. So we're kind of, we're moving over closer towards like the very, very end. So for sure... I mean, we can still speculate on it, but I think 100% now this points to um, that it was the, the liberal ministers and it was Justin mm -hmm. Trudeau that invoked the Emergencies Act, uh, despite the fact that they had pretty much every single intelligence source and agency mm -hmm. in Canada telling them that they should be doing the exact opposite, showing them different ways, negotiation methods, anything that would not actually cause cause uh panic right like um I, I think it's pretty simple i think yeah. it was uh it's common sense but they chose to do it anyway so i'd like to know why you know that 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 hot potato has now been thrown in that direction we've gotten two more people out of the way so mm -hmm. it's just this process of elimination was so tedious at first and now i'm looking so forward to hearing the mm -hmm. ministers testify no, it'll definitely be interesting and i think you know i, I always find it interesting how uh, the lawyer for Peter Slowly, counsel for Peter Slowly, yeah. um, brought up the fact that as a police officer, as a police service, your first method mm -hmm. to handle a protest is negotiation and de-escalation. Yeah. And we keep hearing that all levels of government who are refusing to meet with the protester, mm -hmm. who are refusing to literally even negotiate, hear their concerns, hear the concerns of thousands of Canadians who are fed up with the COVID-19 mandates and that travel to Ottawa to make their disagreement known. Tom, what do you think? So when I watch Brendan's um, <laughs> cross-examination for Miller time, uh, of course, <laughs> that's, time. Always, the, that's time. always the best part of the, the entire uh, event. But I have to say, uh, maybe, I don't know, because I think Brendan's uh, family was in town this weekend. So yeah. we got to see a much better, uh, brighter, <laughs> pumped up version of Brendan. But I have to say of all of the... Uh, the cross-examinations that he's done today, I, I think, was a new level of Brendan Miller. Uh, the way he had framed his questions, like he started to uh, question the two officials on what they believed was suspicion. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was another legal term that he used, it, and they were very unclear about what that that actual those definitions were yeah. uh, you know suspicion where you can take actual law enforcement action and and they said they they were kind of confused by it but then as he he went on more he was talking about um you know he was leading them down this path mm -hmm. and he, you could see that he was setting the trap oh because sure. I, I, i've noticed that brendan likes to set these traps and he's sent it setting these <laughs> traps and just when you thought he was going to do it, he's like, you, you agree with this, you agree with that, you agree yeah. with that. And then he said, okay, so you agree that it wasn't, you know, necessary. And then he said, no, I don't agree. <laughs> it's like, you want your cake, but you're not, you know, like, what's the saying? You want your cake and eat it too. Um, it was really frustrating to listen to that witness towards the end, because basically mm -hmm. what he was saying is like, okay, CSIS didn't want it. We've known that the RCMP didn't didn't want it. Even under Section 12 of the CSIS Act, it didn't fit the parameters, didn't fit the parameters for Section 2. So you had nothing. Yeah. But then at the end, he says, well, didn't don't you agree that um, the government never met the threshold? So who were they listening to? And they said, no, Cabinet wanted it. So then Brendan says, to your knowledge, is Justin Trudeau trained in law enforcement or intelligence? And he said, well, I don't speak to that. And Brendan said, I can tell you, he's not. He was a drama <laughs> teacher, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, when you look at, at, at the CSIS Act, you know, a threat to the security of Canada 
It means espionage or sabotage. It means foreign influence activities within or relating to Canada that are detrimental to the interests of Canada and are clandestine or deceptive or involve a threat to any person. C, activities within or relating to Canada direct, directed towards or in support of the threat or use of acts of serious violence against persons or property for the purpose of achieving a political, religious, or ideological objective within Canada or a foreign state. And finally, activities directed towards undermining by covered unlawful act or directed towards or intended ultimately to lead to the destruction uh, of property and such. So I don't think that the Freedom Convoy met that threshold. And I think that that is what we're seeing through evidence that is brought up by, uh, by Brendan Miller, that is brought up by Council for the GCCF, Council for the Democracy Fund, yes. other pro- Freedom Council, we're not seeing that this that these thresholds were met. Well, you know, and we we heard very early when the two witnesses got there, there was the difference between groups in the government that consume intelligence, and then the right. other groups that exactly. produce the intelligence. Mm -hmm. And and you have to be careful of who is producing and who is consuming it. Yeah. And my impression was that there was a group that was producing intelligence, but the group that was actually consuming it was ignoring it. And I think that's just clearly because they didn't like the answer. Mm -hmm. They didn't like that the, uh, um, the leader of the CSIS, I uh, mm -hmm. can't remember his title or his name. I, I remember reading it. Vigneault, I think is his name. Yeah. Uh, basically recommended, we, we heard this testimony last week and then we got to review it at again, that he was saying, if you go ahead and do this, what you're going to end up doing is getting the negative or the opposite reaction of what you want, which is now you're going to inspire an IMVE, uh, an ideologically motivated, violent extremism, right? You're going to actually inspire that. And then you're going to possibly make the lone wolf scenario something to, to start to have to consider. Yeah. And so when you heard that, that recommendation and then you're, he, Brendan brought it back to them and said, Hey, what about this? And it's like they, they're agreeing, they're agreeing, and they're agreeing. And then you get to the one yard line and they're kind of like, no, nah, I don't agree. Yeah. So no, well, you just that's... contradicted everything that you just walked through with Brendan. Yeah. Well, that's why it always is contradictions. All right. Well, thanks for that deep analysis, lawyer, lawyer Marazzo, King's counsel, Tom Marazzo. All right. Let's take a look at clip, <laughs> clip number seven, where, well, we've been talking about Miller time, Brendan Miller cross examining um, Rob Stewart. Let's take a look at how that went. Bureau or agency or law enforcement agency told the government, here's the evidence of reasonable and probable grounds or reasonable grounds of a Section 2 CSIS Act threat. And you know, I take it now because it's advised to you that that's required to invoke the Emergencies Act. It's in the documents. You were advised of that. Yes. Right. So what agency gave you the evidence and the intelligence that said, hey, we have reasonable grounds of a Section 2 CSIS Act threat? There wasn't one, was there? So let me um, explain. Uh, nobody uh, bringing advice to the table other than CSIS is uh, assessing uh, that uh, against that threat. Nobody advising the cabinet. The cabinet is making that decision and their interpretation of the law is what governs here and the advice they get. And their, their decision was evidently that the threshold was met. Well, I interpreted that I'm allowed to kill you. That's how I interpret the law. <laughs> that's, that's really what well. makes something legal <laughs> or illegal. What, what did you think of his cross-examination, Brendan, uh, Brendan um, Miller? I think it's painful to watch them <laughs> squirm. Uh, like that silence was, it was so loud in my ears. It just, oh, it like irks me. But again, that's what you get when Brendan Miller walks up to the stand. You just know, like, that's why it's, it's literally a huge topic on Twitter. Every time it's Miller time, people are like, zoned in, honed in, because they know that he's about to drop a huge truth bomb and that something crazy is going to be unveiled. It's nothing that we didn't maybe already, you know, interpret uh, because of what information has come out already, but uh, oh, the silence. Yeah, no, it's oh, definitely great. Silence. You know, last week was, last week was calmer. 
Um, yes, definitely. It had a little bit. It was still a super interesting week, and we heard some great testimony and some great evidence was presented. For instance, the Kutz border blockade were the Kut, the Kutz border blockades were dealt with prior to the EA being involved. And so we was saw the one that. at Windsor. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, you know, we saw that last week, um, but it was still a calmer week, but I, I, I can say that I have under good authority that this week's going to be a lot more interesting. It's going to be, it's going to be very great to, to, to follow. Uh, Tom, what did you make of his testimony and this response, basically saying that they, they didn't receive any intel from any actual authority saying that it should be involved. Yeah. And, and you're right about the, um, that silent, that silent moment. I remember that silent moment and I wasn't looking and I'm, and I had to look up and I'm like, that's weird. Painful. Right? It, was, like, it oh. was painful, that yeah. silence. Right. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's remarkable because there's, they're, they're talking about the intelligence and the law enforcement agencies with this kind within the country, but somehow cabinet knew better. Yeah. Right. They, they blatantly disregarded the advice and the access, their, their ability to be the consumers of that intelligence, but because they didn't like the answer, they went a different route. Yeah. And I think we're going to find out when they testify that it's going to be really probably they're going to be hard pressed to justify it. Well, think about it too. Like you have two deputy ministers that are serving two ministers, right? A hundred percent from the liberal cabinet who have just said today, hundred percent that they advised against invoking the emergency act. These two people, it was a steward and wrote, Ro, Ro, I, I cannot pronounce his name, but when you have that and it, it's so in front of you, it just, I, and I can't wait to see what it's going to be like next week. Mm -hmm. Like it's, I'm not sure what sort of excuses they're going to have. Again, this has just been a process of elimination and as I suspected, but now I can confirm that mm -hmm. like these even the, their own deputy ministers were like, hey, we don't have to hit the panic button. We can certainly do these other tactics instead. We have X, Y, Z in our arsenal, in our tool toolbox, et cetera, to use instead of just hitting the Emergencies Act button. And uh, they still chose to go forward with it. So again, I'm not sure what sort of excuses they're going to have. Yeah, you're, you're really, absolutely I'm not. right. It will be almost impossible for the Liberal cabinet who's testifying yeah. next week to actually find a proper justification for the use of the emergency, especially when Brendan Miller starts cross-examining them. <laughs> and we just, we, we even saw that, <laughs> that, that would be great. <laughs> and we even saw some of it later today too, when some evidence was presented by Rob Kitteridge um, about the LRB, the Liberal Research Bureau. Now I just want to wait, we have Keith Wilson in the background. I want to wait until he comes on to go into that a little bit deeper because he's actually a King's Counsel, unlike Tom. Even though I, I just said, look like one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Even though I said that Tom was a King's Council earlier, but we saw some great evidence presented today by uh, the GCCF in relation to the uh, the the, the I LRB. Um, all right, let's look a little bit deeper into um, Stewart's testimony once again. Let's take a look at clip number five, uh, where it's um, yeah, where, where where the deputy mean the the public safety deputy minister was concerned that if invoking DEA could potentially uh, provoke the freedom convoy protesters to be even more violent. Well, not even more violent, to actually become violent because they weren't violent uh, initially. Let's take a look at that clip number uh, five. Around the pros and cons of using the Emergencies Act, and one of the concerns that I had at the time was of the potential for serious violence. So, in fact, one of the reasons to invoke the act was also a concern in terms of what happens when you invoke it. Um, and, and if it were uh, to um, lead people to become uh, violent, then that would be you know, an, un, uh, an, an undesirable outcome. So we were, that was just one of the many considerations we were discussing. So essentially it might do more harm than good by, by inciting rather than calming? That's right. Okay. Wow. <laughs> it's incredible. Every time I hear it, I'm like, it's that much more real. Like I joke about it, but you know, we literally hear this from every single testimony. It doesn't matter what they say that, um, even in cross-examination, it doesn't matter what they say to try and, and make that entire statement seem less than it is. Every single person has agreed that it could have been helpful or was helpful in some way, but absolutely not necessary to invoke a counter-terrorist act. The, the, the ex, what was it? The war measures act is what mm -hmm. it was called the war measures acts these were peaceful protesters that came to protest lawfully mm -hmm. peacefully in canada's capital what more what more can there be 
Really, it's 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 incredulous. Really, it's not, it's not even the first time that we that we hear it that it could incite violence within the protester. It's not it's not the first time we they were keep warned by CSIS. They're warned yeah. by the RCMP. Like these are huge, huge like intelligence ops that provided this information weeks, even weeks leading up towards mm -hmm. the invocation of the Emergencies Act. So I'm not, again, it's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's same, incredible to me. <laughs> same thing over and over again. It yeah. just reaffirms once again that it was not necessary, that it could actually provoke violence when there was no violence at the beginning. You mentioned the War Measures Act. The only times in history where these these legislature have been used is during World War War World War One, World War II, yeah. the FLQ crisis. Not... The Freedom Convoy doesn't even match any of those. Well, it's, of course not, it's but they're going to make them out to, think, to be similar. Yeah, it's, it's unbelievable it's something that Justin Trudeau actually thought he could equate the, yeah. the, the Freedom Convoy to these crises. Tom? Well, you know, we if, if we look at right across the board, all of the different socioeconomic differences amongst the people that attended the convoy. We had doctors, we had lawyers, we had veterinarians. We had carpenters, we had electricians, mm -hmm. we had all walks of life from every province. We had the, the most phenomenal sample of Canadians that all, you know, came to Ottawa for that protest. And so for, for the general public out there that is against the convoy, it's very neat and tidy. If you can put them all into a box as a certain small percentage or fringe minority sector of our society. But in this case, you can't do that. It was all of Canada that came to Ottawa. It was the truckers that inspired or, or gave everybody like me, a former military guy, the opportunity to come to Ottawa. So the truckers were the ones that were, you know, they, they lit the spark, but it was all of Canada that came to Ottawa. And so what you're seeing is this kind of narrative where it's better to put them all into one little container. Mm -hmm. So it's easier to frame them as being this fringe minority of bad people. But we know this when we hear the testimony that they, they can't make that argument, right? It just doesn't, it doesn't equate in any way. And so it's really nice to see that they're admitting certain things, but again, this is a lot of, this is also a court of public opinion. You know, the, the public gets to watch this and see the evidence for this themselves, hear the testimony and make a decision about the, the convoy. Uh, but I think it's obviously clear it was never required. Yeah, it was never required. Of course, it was never required. And even even he testified to it today, Rob Stewart, <laughs> when when Rob Kilrich asked him, do you agree with me? that it was helpful but not necessary as many witnesses had testified prior to today he said yeah it was useful he, he agreed <laughs> yeah. with, uh, with kedrich's statement we keep seeing it over and over again it's great and you talked about the court of public opinion i, I agree with you um and even today we saw the ndp put out a press release saying that they would like to see an independent inquiry into the federal COVID-19 measures that have been taken throughout the pandemic. You know, I think it's a little bit odd to hear that considering that Jack Mead has been following Trudeau in every single move he made. But I, I think it still shows that while the NDP continues to support Trudeau, they might see a political opportunity. Yeah, I just wrote that earlier today. I think they might see a political opportunity to go against Trudeau, seeing how the inquiry is going. And now they're asking for an independent inquiry into the federal COVID-19 response by the Liberal government. Very interesting. Tom, your, your, your thoughts on that? And after we'll let you go and we'll bring in Keith, uh, Keith Wilson. Yeah, I think what you're seeing is uh, another example of buyer's remorse with the NDP sort of uh, associating associating themselves with, with Trudeau. But, but, you know, Mr. Singh recently said, no matter what the outcome of this is, he's still going to um, maintain his relationship with the, the federal liberals and uh, keep the coalition going strong. Um, so he, he's going to, he's perfectly happy to trample on civil liberties for dental care. Okay. For dental work. Um, but I think he's, he's playing both sides of the, the fence here. That's oh, really he what he's doing. Is. Obviously right. like he's hedging his bets is what he's doing. Of course. Well, it's thanks shameful. so much. Thanks so much for coming on Tom. Great suit. Once again, it's great, great tie that you wore today. And we'll I look forward I, to seeing you tomorrow. I think Keith is going to break the tie. <laughs> Yeah, we'll see. All right. Stay tuned everyone. We'll go on a short <laughs> break. When we come back, we'll have freedom convoy lawyer, Keith Wilson. 
Kings Council. Join us on the live stream. Stay tuned. Uh-huh.